For nearly a year and a half in the mid-1980s, a terrorist group known as the Monster with 21 Faces unleashed chaos on Japan's candy industry. Kidnapping, poisoning, extortion and blackmail. It was cruel and violent and remains a mystery to this day. It happened like this. The Azaki Glico Company is famous for its range of Pocky confectionaries. They now come in a range of flavours, but the originals are little tin biscuit sticks covered in chocolate. The company was founded in 1919 and has a long tradition of making confectionery. After taking some damage to its factories and manufacturing during World War II, the company saw a resurgence in popularity with the creation of the Pocky in the 1960s. Pocky remains popular to this day in Japan and internationally, particularly with teenagers. In 1984, the president of the company was Katsuhisa Izaki, and on a Sunday evening on the 18th of March, he and his family were relaxing in their luxurious home in the western Japanese city Hyogo near Osaka. Azaki lived with his wife, a young son, two daughters, and next door to him lived his elderly mother. He had been the president of the multi-million dollar company for nearly two years at this stage, and the company was thriving. It sold everything now from ice cream to hamburger meat, and profits were steadily rising. The previous year, it had over $68 million in sales. At about 9pm, two armed men broke into Azaki's mother's home. One was armed with a pistol and the other an air gun. They wore white ski masks and black jumpers and they forced the terrified woman to hand over the keys to Azaki's house before tying her up. They then cut the phone lines to the main house before bursting in and tying up his wife and eldest daughter also. Izaki had just come home from work and was starting to relax and soak in a nice warm bath when he heard a strange noise from somewhere else in the house. Moments later, the two armed men burst into the bathroom and pointed the guns at him. They pulled him naked and shouting from the bath, threw a coat on him and then muscled him into a car waiting outside. His youngest son and daughter were left undisturbed, sleeping in their beds. They then took Azaki to an abandoned warehouse in an unknown location. About three hours later, a person discovered a ransom note in a nearby phone booth and called a company executive. The note demanded 1 billion yen, or 4.5 million dollars at the time, and 100 kilograms of gold. It also warned the reader not to contact the police. The police were, in fact, contacted, and were just starting to figure out the case and track down the perpetrators when two days later, Izaki somehow managed to escape. It looked like this may have been a simple enough, if not rare, case of kidnap, until newspapers across Japan received copies of a strange and boastful letter from the kidnappers three weeks later. The letter, the first of many, called the police idiots and a waste of taxpayers' money and taunted them with extra hints about the kidnapping, saying what colour the car they drove was and what kind of food they ate. It even threatened to kidnap the head of the police too. The letter was signed off with Monster with 21 Faces. This name appeared to be a reference to a well-known character from a children's series of books. In this case, the fiend with 20 faces was a gentleman thief and a master of disguise and the arch enemy of the country's greatest detective and his son and friends known as the Boys Detectives Club. Over the next few months, this group sent many letters to the press. Dozens of them. Mostly they made fun of the police, but they also contained more clues and jokes. The clues never really led anywhere, and police were stumped. The group had also stepped up their terror campaign against the company, setting fire to vehicles owned by staff. In mid-May, however, one of the letters was more serious, and things took a more sinister turn. The letter claimed to have laced several packages of glico candy with cyanide. The group didn't say which ones and this sent the company into a tailspin. 
Glicko recalled everything, all of its candy from shelves, but they couldn't find any cyanide. It was a relief, but the damage to the company's reputation had been done, and the people of Japan were terrified to eat anything from them. As well as being afraid to eat the candy, the public were also fascinated with the group and the story was everywhere. The way the group wrote the letters appealed more to the common man. They spoke in an Osaka dialect which came across as anti-Tokyo and anti-capital and the letters were peppered with humour and slang. They also didn't seem particularly interested in money. The ransom for the captured CEO was quickly forgotten about and there is no record of the group ever accepting money from anyone. They would ask for huge amounts of cash and then fail to turn up and collect it. Once, they made a Glico employee turn up to a phone booth, but when the police turned up in disguise, the group were two steps ahead. They taunted the police for trying to trick them, but this also shows they had the capability to watch what was happening without being caught. About a month later, they decided to ease up on Glico, writing in a letter that they had forgiven the company's president and he had suffered enough. They had forgiven him for whatever crimes in their mind he had committed against them. Amusingly, they also said they had a four-year-old kid in the group that loves Glico and cries for it every day, so it was time to let up and let him have his favourite candy again. In typical fashion, the letter had humour but also a sinister element, threatening to target other cities internationally in the new year, like London and Paris. It wasn't long before the group were back out terrorising Japan again, however. This time, it was another candy company called Morinaga. The group demanded the equivalent of $400,000 from them. And when Morinaga didn't comply, the group sent another shell-shocking letter to the media. In it, they addressed the mothers of Japan, warning them that their children's favourite candy was now dangerous. They claimed to have laced 20 boxes of the candy with cyanide in different cities stretching from Hakata to Tokyo. Police swarmed convenience stores, and this time the group were telling the truth. Boxes of Morinaga choco balls and angel pies were found with extra labels saying, Danger contains poison. You'll die if you eat this. Monster with 21 faces. And this time, when the candy was tested, it did in fact contain the deadly poison. The company's stocks plummeted, but they didn't recall their candy. The group, knowing this, warned them that if they didn't, there would be many more boxes without any warning labels. Ominously, they said it was going to be like a treasure hunt. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I do all the production, research, editing and mixing. Everything myself. And I really appreciate every listener that I get. You can support the podcast by joining my Patreon for just $5 a month where you get access to some bonus content. I'm also on social media and YouTube. I'm glad you are enjoying It Happened Like This and I'm very thankful for your support. Now back to the episode. The police now mounted a massive operation. Knowing that the group usually struck at the weekend, they had 40,000 officers stake out supermarkets for multiple weekends in a row. They poured over CCTV footage and finally caught a still of a man with curly hair, a baseball cap and glasses, placed something on a shelf. The footage of the man was hard to identify. The police also knew that at least two men had been involved in the kidnapping of Azaki. It would seem then that they didn't know how many people were involved and who it was they were supposed to be looking for. At the end of June is probably when the police got closest to capturing one of the group. They made an agreement with one candy company that they would stop the reign of terror in exchange for 50 million yen, about $210,000. The employee was to toss the ransom money onto a local train heading for Kyoto when a white flag was displayed. The police, again, would try the undercover police officer technique. An officer disguised himself as an employee and headed for the drop point. As the police officer was travelling there, he noticed a strange man on the train watching him. He would later describe this man as well-built, curly hair, a baseball cap 
and glasses. Most noticeably, however, was his eyes. The officer described him as being like a fox, and so the suspect became known as the fox-eyed man. Both men were suspicious, however. The police officer wanted to be sure that he had the right guy, and the fox-eyed man suspected that it was a police officer. They disembarked the train at the same time, but the drop never happened. No flag was displayed. The police tried to tail the man, but they lost him as he headed back towards Kyoto. It was a disaster for the police. Not only had they been close enough to arrest the man, but they voluntarily let him get away. It wouldn't be until November until they had their next chance. The monster group had set up another secret deal. They had intended to steal 100 million yen from the food company House Food Corporation. The plan was the company was to deliver the cash into a can under a white piece of cloth. On the way, the police noticed a man at a rest stop, matching the description of the fox-eyed man. Again, he wore a cap and glasses, but they were sure it was him. They tailed the cash delivery van to the drop point. The white cloth was there, but no can, and so the police concluded it was another wild goose chase from the group. They called the operation off, believing the group was testing the response times of the police. About an hour before the drop, however, a patrol car noticed a station wagon with its engine running and lights off. The car was sitting 50 meters from where the white cloth was hanging. Local police were unaware of the larger operation and cash drop-off. When they pulled up to the man and shone a flashlight in his face, they noticed he was wearing an audio receiver with headphones. The man quickly sped off. The police pursued him but again ultimately lost him. It had been the fox-eyed man. The car was later found abandoned. It had been stolen, and inside they found a radio receiver which had been eavesdropping on all the police units involved in the cash drop operation. Apart from the visual sighting, no hard evidence could trace the police back to the group. The fox-eyed man had escaped again. For the superintendent of the police, Shoji Yamamoto, it was all too much. Unable to live with the embarrassment and failings of his police district, he would pay the ultimate price from all the terror of the past year and commit suicide. In August 1985, he doused himself in kerosene and set himself on fire. A dramatic and terrible way to end things. For the monster with 21 faces, this seemed to be enough for them too. Five days later, they released a letter stating their condolences for the deceased superintendent. They said he died like a man and that the reign of terror on the candy industry was now at an end. The letter ended as such. We decided to forget about torturing food making companies. If anyone blackmails any of the food making companies, it's not us, but someone copying us. We are bad guys. That means we've got more to do other than bullying companies. It's fun to lead a bad man's life. Monster with 21 faces. And that was it. The group was never heard from again. They vanished into thin air. As quickly as they had shown up, they had disappeared. The statute of limitations for the kidnapping of Ozaki ran out in 1994, meaning even if they caught the two men today, they could not be prosecuted. Too much time had passed. Just because nobody was ever convicted doesn't mean that the police didn't have suspects. And one of the main ones was a man named Manabu Miyazaki. Labelled as Mr. M, the police believed he was the fox-eyed man. In 1976, he had released a tape showing his support for a local union who were in a labour dispute with Glico. The tape was surprisingly similar to the tone and declarations of the monster. During the 70s, Mr. M had also been involved in whistleblowing about the Glico company, exposing their dumping of waste into the local rivers and drainage systems. He had also been involved with the resignation of a union leader during that time. More than this, however, was Miyazaki's connections to the criminal underworld. His father was the boss of a local Yakuza group. For those unaware, the Yakuza are a notorious organized crime syndicate known for their complex organizational structure, violence and full body tattoos. The Japanese Mafia. Unfortunately for the police, Mr. M's alibis checked out and he was never arrested or convicted. If anything, the notoriety of being the prime suspect and the infamy of the group 
helped him and his career. He would go on to become a popular social commentator and writer. His biography would sell over half a million copies. The link to the Yakuza is an important one because the police believed they were heavily involved in the workings of the monster with 21 faces. Their campaign of terror happened around the same time as a mob war was raging between two opposing Yakuza factions and they may have had vested interests in seeing some of the candy companies go under. And that is the story of the monster with 21 faces and the infamous Glico Morinaga case. It remains in the back of a generation's minds when they reach for a pocky candy. Nothing was ever solved, so the fear always remains that they could return and begin the reign of chaos on Japan or internationally again. What sticks out for me is the complete lack of control over the situation from the police. There is a social contract that exists where the police are supposed to step in and stop this kind of thing from happening. And for the most part, they do. Most of us take it for granted. The fact that we eat safe food, walk the streets without being attacked or just go about our lives without being bothered is normal. Not everywhere, of course, but in most developed cities and economies. Every now and then, however, we are reminded that the police are just ordinary people too, like us. With enough confidence and intelligence, a relatively small group of people can and will upend the lives of thousands or even millions of people. The whole story and its origins has a kind of comic book feel and in some ways maybe the culture of manga and comic books in Japan fed the story a little. It's easy to see how imaginations could run wild, particularly when the letters were constant, the tone was that of a comic book villain and the crimes were so bizarre and brazen. It's hard to say whether the social contract in today's society is decaying or not. Are we all less likely to work for the community and each other? Is everyone out for themselves? Or does it just seem that way because of the constant barrage of media and news we are fed all day every day? The terror attacks on major cities, concerts and school shootings of the past two decades are devastating and instant. They cause maximum damage in a short amount of time. The fallout from them lasts for years and as badly as they divide society, they also manage to pull people together in grief. The terror of this case, however, was a slow burn, an ominous feeling that something wasn't right and we are all, as a society, vulnerable. Like a serial killer stalking a neighbourhood or a cyber attack on critical infrastructure. Whether the motivations of the monster were purely criminal or they did in fact enjoy being the bad guy is unclear. The results, however, were the same. And there were real victims. Not just the president of the police or the company's reputation. Staff were targeted, jobs were lost and the economy as a whole was damaged, affecting indirectly a huge amount of people. Could the police have done a better job? Maybe. Could the media have handled the situation better? Probably. If your favourite food, or even potentially everything you eat from the grocery store, could contain a deadly poison, how would you deal with it? What about the food you give your children? Remember that the group specifically targeted confectionery aimed at the youth. If this happened today, what could we do differently? Stick to fruit and veg and meat? Maybe they would have found a way to contaminate even that. There is an old Japanese proverb that roughly translates to The weak are the meal, the strong eat. The original villain in the children's story had 20 faces, but this monster had 21. Was the 21st face a reflection of society and its problems? Are we the meal or are we the monster?